welcome everybody to the International Business Career Panel for the GWSB Career Week 2021. I just wanted to thank real quick all the students for joining us this evening, our exceptional panelists, as well as Dr. Helm, our moderator. Uh, my name is Emily Baxter. I work in the Career Center as the Employer Relations Manager, and I'm just going to be facilitating the Q&A and just helping with logistics in the background. So. I'll go over a little bit the format for the students. We will have one hour program this evening with moderated questions from Dr. Helm. And throughout the program, you are more than welcome to put questions that come to mind in the chat box or the Q&A. It doesn't matter to me. I'll be mo uh, monitoring both of them. But we will take a break at the end of the panel and answer questions, but feel free to kind of input those as we go along um, as you think of them. That is no problem. So um, we will do our moderated questions, go to Q and a, and then wrap up for the evening. So. Without further ado, I just again wanted to introduce Dr. Helm as our moderator. Uh, Dr. Helm, thank you so much for being here with us this evening. Uh, so everyone is just kind of aware a little bit of your background. Uh, Dr. Helm is the Associate Teaching Professor of International Business at GWSB, where she serves as the Faculty Director of the Center for International Business Education and Research, or GW Cyber. Uh, the GW Cyber is one of 15 cybers in the United States, and it's funded by the US Department of Education. Uh, Dr. Helm teaches courses on international marketing management, green business, cultural environment of international business, as well as export and foreign market entry strategy. Uh, she has developed and taught several online courses and regularly offers courses with real life client consulting projects. Uh, since 2010, she has taught international consulting courses in Sweden and other countries with projects in both the clean tech and healthcare industries with a particular focus on high tech startups. So again, Dr. Helm, thank you so much for being here and for moderating our panel this evening. Oh, absolutely. It's uh, my pleasure for sure, Emily. It's been such a pleasure working with you in developing this panel. We are really so lucky at GW to have a dedicated career center for, for business students specifically in Fowler. And again, it's been a true pleasure, very exciting and terrific process. And, and I know we're all grateful for having these services that you offer Emily and the rest of the Fowler team. So thank you for that. Um, <clears throat> what I wanted to mention too, just quickly is that we are lucky in all kinds of ways here at GW. Uh, the other one that I wanted to mention is that we do have a dedicated center for international business, which is funded by the Department of Education is a very prestigious center. And we actually get federal funding to put on different events and programming for students. So you should definitely keep an eye out for us. GW Cyber is what we go by. Uh, we offer uh, specifically an international business boot camp. We have a trade track that we've uh, uh, put in place before. We have traveled to Norfolk, for example, to bring students to to see how really actual uh, international trade happens on the ground. So lots of different events pertaining to career and careers and things like that. So don't forget about the, the center if you're really seriously interested in international business. And then also what I wanted to mention is that, uh, yes, I'm moderating these questions, but I've actually asked uh, the students in my international marketing class for some input because I wanted to make sure that we get the voices of the students in here, not only in the Q&A, but actually in the uh, the um, uh, event in the moderated questions as well. So thank you to my students. I know some of you are here tonight. So uh, I wanted to thank, of course, the students for being here. Very important. This is critical that you start exploring careers early, whether it's international business or something else. And also, of course, I want to thank the panelists for being here. I've had the pleasure to meet them informally before, but they are just such an impressive group of women. And it's interesting, we didn't actually on purpose design it to be only women uh, panelists, but uh, it ended up happening. And uh, again, I think it's it's great to see you in these leadership roles, and we really are grateful for you sharing uh, your expertise and insights with the students here tonight. Uh, I just wanted to mention who is here uh, in terms of these uh, fabulous uh, panelists, but you all have the bios. So to students, you have the bios and Emily has shared the link. Um, I'm not going to read through those, uh, but I have asked each panelist to just in a minute or less, just actually say a little bit about their current position so that you get a sense of what they do in their own words. 
Now, just to mention who is all here, we have Lauren Benny from, uh, uh, and she's a global manager uh, of corporate responsibility at TE Connectivity, and she'll tell you a little bit about that role. Uh, she works in philanthropy and also community engagement programs. She happens to be also a GW alumna and uh, specifically from the Elliott School. And then we have Allison Kaplan here. She's a director of global marketing communications at uh, Apple. And uh, she works in the in-house uh, marketing team. And I know when we talked last time, she oversees a lot of different aspects in uh, marketing at Apple. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. And she's also an alumna from GW in mass communications. And then we have Tatiana uh, Nikiforova. And she is the director and co-head of execution at Delphos International. She works in um, f international finance um, in terms of uh, development projects across emerging markets. And um, she happens also to be a GW alumna from the Elliott School as well. And then we have Stacy Zolthara, and she's vice president and head of global employee and ex executive communications at Visa. Uh, and uh, she works uh, specifically in executive uh, communications with a focus on, on inclusion and diversity and CSR. Again, fantastic to have all of you here. Thank you. And uh, I would like to emphasize that I want this to be an, in kind of an informal discussion rather than kind of a stilted uh, pre-planned um, you know, uh, yeah, sequence of answers, right? So feel free to jump in any time, but I'm gonna start off in the order that I just introduced you. So I'm gonna go to Lauren first to ask you to just say briefly, what is your current position? What do you actually uh, work with at uh, TE Connectivity? Thank you so much, Dr. Helm, and hello, students. I'm so happy to be here this evening. Um, TE Connectivity, I always say, is the biggest company you've probably never heard of. We make connectors and sensors for a broad range of end markets, meaning all the little things that make, you know, a, a airbag deploy in a car or the electrical wiring on a plane to keep the wings level, um, all of those very small components that go into bigger things is what we make. We're a $13 billion, 80,000 employee uh, organization. We operate in 150 countries. Um, in my capacity as the global manager of corporate responsibility, I'm responsible primarily for two things, which is all of our corporate philanthropy, uh, including the TE Connectivity Foundation, which mostly focuses on uh, supporting organizations in STEM and encouraging women in underserved communities to enter science, technology, engineering, and math fields. And then my other responsibility is all of our environmental, social, and governance, or ESG reporting, um, which includes uh, executing and developing our sustainability strategy for TE and reporting that to all of our key stakeholders, including our investors, customers, and our employees. Um, I still live in Washington, D.C. As Dr. Helm mentioned, I'm an alumni of the Elliott School, um, and I still live up in Petworth with my wife and my uh, border colleague. So happy to be here. Great. Thank you so much, Lauren. Appreciate that. Is so now we're going to go to Allison for a little bit of an introduction as well. Okay. Thanks, Anna. Hi, everyone. I'm happy to be here as well. Um, I would say good evening, but it's still 2 o'clock my time from the West Coast. Uh, I uh, I'm a director at Apple, and I've been at Apple for seven years now. I work in uh, Marcom, which is our marketing communications. It's basically an internal uh, marketing agency, um, for lack of a better word, and we do all of our marketing uh, in in-house. I oversee a team um, that does lots of different functions, and about eight of them actually. So, um, art direction being one of them, which is essentially creating our brand campaign. So, what our product um, marketing looks like for every campaign out in the world, including out of home billboards to um, uh, retail, what it looks like when you walk into an Apple retail store um, channel, which is uh, when you any any store that's not an Apple owned store, like a Best Buy or a Target, but worldwide, um, we create kits um, of parts of, of marketing materials that then get localized um, in worldwide. Uh, also, events and um, product launch keynotes, like one we had last week where we announced the new iPhone 13. Um, we do packaging, so all of the packaging for all of the products. 
um, corporate ID and a few other ancillary things as well. So it's a small team, small but mighty team. And I like to think of myself as a conductor of an orchestra. Um, that's probably the best way to describe what I do on a daily basis. Okay, great. Yes, like we said, lots of different things on your plate, <laughs> right? Uh, so, Tatiana, why don't you go ahead and do the same kind of introduction? Yeah, sure. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, really nice to be here. I work for Adelphos International. I'm a, direct, a director and co-head of the transaction execution team. Delphos is a financial advisory firm uh, headquartered in Washington, D.C. We specialize in raising debt and equity financing for projects, uh, mostly infrastructure projects in emerging markets. And our niche really is raising funding from bilateral and multilateral development banks, uh, impact lenders and investors, family foundations, and all kinds of uh, impactful sources of funding. Uh, so we are a team of about 45 professionals across geographies. Our core team is based in Washington, D.C., but we also have colleagues in, um, in the U.K., in China, in Guatemala, in India, um, and a few other places, smaller offices there. Yeah, and so what I do is basically uh, I lead um, several transactions. I lead the whole execution team. Uh, and on top of that, I lead several transactions, which means basically supporting the transaction process throughout its life cycle from origination, identifying investors, putting together investment documents, uh, leading the outreach, uh, uh, shortlisting investors, negotiating terms of financing, uh, assisting with due diligence, and all the way through to sort of disbursement of funds. Uh, and that's where our mandate typically ends. And that's that's my role. Okay, great. Thank you, Tatiana. And now we're going to go to Stacy uh, to talk a little bit about her role at Visa. Sure. Thanks so much. And it's great to be here with all of you. Um, as Anna shared, I'm the global head of employee and executive communications at Visa, which means that it's my job to both build our global messaging in a way that captures the employee hearts and minds and really rallies them as our most important stakeholder and empowers executives to best reach our employees to help them to understand not only what our mission and our purpose is, but also what are our key business initiatives, our business strategy, what's their role in it, and how do we need to activate them in order to make that happen. And in an organization with um, almost 22,000 employees spread across every region of the world. That's a really complicated um, uh, problem to solve, particularly right now amid a global pand pandemic, which means that not only are employees completely dispersed, but executives have to tap into a completely different set of communication skills in order to engage and build a cohesive culture at this time particularly against um, kind of the intersectionality of all the challenges that we know that people are facing um, at the moment. I actually um, am also an alumni of um, George Washington University. I got my master's in the School of Political awesome. Management. And I mentioned that solely to say, um, my background is actually in corporate reputation and not in employee communications. And this role is new for me um, because, and I was brought into it because I bring an international business perspective to employee communications, and I've spent over 20 years working in public affairs, um, political journalism, political management, um, and crisis communications for companies, which makes me exactly the right person to deal with employee comms during this extraordinary time. So what I do day in and day out is help our executives to tackle some of the really tough questions that we and every other company of our size and stature are dealing with at this moment. Well, sorry for missing that. That's just that's even okay. better. We only have GW alumni here today. I didn't even realize I again apologies for that, but thank you for bringing it in and putting it into such a, you know, helpful context also. So, okay, great. So, um I thought I'm sure all the students have noticed by now we have uh, you know, really, you know, diverse um panel here today in terms of the different disciplines that are involved in the different aspects of business, the different different functional areas. And uh, this is on purpose because international business is really complex when we start talking about careers because there's so many different paths to take 
and so many best practices and possibilities and opportunities. So that's why we wanted to bring this variety of perspectives in. But what I wanted to do now is to kind of go around our table um, to ask you what your daily activities look like. Um, and again, it's, it's to give students an understanding of like, what do you actually do when you work in international business? And again, we have a variety of perspectives here, but then most importantly, probably to tell us what it is that excites you about the international role that you have. What is that the passion piece, so to speak? And I don't know, uh, Stacey, if you want to start since we kind of left you to the end last time. Sure, I'm happy to. Well, my days usually begin really early. Um, like Allison, I'm based on the West Coast, um, which means a lot of 6 a.m. calls. Um, I had, uh, I've had two so far this week. I'll have another one tomorrow. Um, and, but it does oftentimes mean that my weeks end a little early too. My Friday mornings tend to, my Friday afternoons rather, tend to be a little quiet because I'm the last market to go, to go through the end of the work week. Um, someone once said to me that a global role is not a job, it's a lifestyle. And I think that's very true. I always tell that to people when they're thinking about going into any sort of global um, responsibility. Um, one of the things that I really love about being with a global company and particularly in a global role is that it satisfies that's kind of journalist in me, that endless curiosity. Um, I am also a, um, a really avid traveler, although not at the current moment. Um, and, uh, and a really curious adventurer of all things. I lived overseas and um, spent four years in Singapore and um, particularly worked in developing markets in Southeast Asia. So having a global role in the before times of the pandemic gave me an excuse to get out and travel and be able to explore different cultures. It continues to give me exposure and challenge my mindset in terms of the way that people take in information, the way that people think, the cultural assumptions that we make. And a key component of my role, particularly now in terms of the um, culture and engagement compo component and empowering um, executives to reach employees in all corners of the globe is to constantly be challenging our assumptions around what day-to-day -day life is in our particular market. And, um, you know, that's really true in the pandemic because things are so uneven worldwide. Um, and, you know, our executive team is primarily based in the United States. So constantly asking those questions and challenging those assumptions is a key component of the international piece of my role. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, what about um, Allison? Do you wanna share some thoughts as well? Sure. Um, my 11 year old daughter says, um, when asked what I do for a living that I, um, make calls and send emails, which she's not wrong. Um, I do feel like that is, um, that does kind of at a high level summarize it. But, um, the, the thing I love about my job is that I, I have, I oversee and, um, have my fingers in lots of, or many different types of things, um, which is extremely exciting, which makes every single day different. Um, the the global nature of the of the role is interesting in that we're a US based company. Um, we have geos, so we have marketing offices in the geos. And so we create assets at the worldwide level and then we work with the geos to localize them. And um, that's uh, when I think things get really interesting, which is we've created something and then as it gets closer to launch, we find that it may not be able to be localized in just the way that we had imagined. And that could be anything from a headline to a photograph or some sort of a visual. And so I think those are the types of things where, um, where it gets, ex gets exciting and interesting from a global standpoint. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, Lauren, what about you? Sure, to echo some of my panelists. Definitely a lot of calls. Um, I am on the East Coast, so I don't have to get up quite as early um, as some of my West Coast colleagues, but um, I do have calls usually with my team members. I have, um, on my direct team, we're here in DC, um, Austin, uh, Belgium, China, Toronto. So depending on um, who I'm talking to and coordinating with, it usually starts in Europe and ends in Asia Pacific with the time zones. Um, we also, I really, something I love about my role is I could get on the phone with someone from anywhere in the world. 
um, operating in so many different countries. And through each of those calls, even though we might have a particular work topic, you know, inevitably you learn something about that particular location, culture, um, people of those countries as well, um, just sharing you know, tidbits about our home life, especially in this work from home uh, culture or, um, you know, different holidays. Uh, so that's always a fun thing to do. And, you know, within the role of sustainability, um, which we can talk more about later in the panel, there's so many different disciplines and there's so many different topic areas. So another thing working in a, a large global company in a role such as the ones that we have, we speak with people from all different types of backgrounds, disciplines, levels within the organization. I could go from talking to our CEO to talking to someone in one of our uh, manufacturing plants um, within one day. So being able to tailor your communications and messages and being also able to connect with that many people within an organization and learn what the company truly does in all of our different end markets is uh, really interesting when you work for a large global organization. So that's a little bit about my day. Great, thank you. And then Tatiana, last but not least. Yeah, so I, I'll, I'll second some of the sentiments that were shared by my fellow panelists working in the, uh, in the international markets and especially all well, my focus is emerging markets, which makes it uh, sometimes way more chaotic, but also exciting. Um, yeah, my, my, my days vary very much depending on the, the, the transactions I'm working on and you know, depending on the stage of the transaction. I uh, can uh, go from, uh, I don't know, reaching out to investors and lenders to uh, putting together, or rather, I, I'm not, I don't do it myself anymore, but like overseeing uh, drafting of um, investment decks and financial models, uh, then to reviewing a term sheet and, and getting on a call with a lender and a client to negotiate uh, the best possible terms for our clients. And to answering investors' questions. Uh, Pre-COVID, we uh, traveled quite a bit as well. As part of the due diligence process, we would, you know, sort of support our clients and travel to the project site. That's always very exciting because you get to see the concrete project <laughs> that you're working on, that you're helping to manifest. Um, and that's, it makes your work uh, feel a lot more real rather than nebulous. Uh, and that's always very rewarding. And uh, all of the projects we work on and all the companies we work uh, with are uh, impactful, uh, right? So they have impact implicit or explicit in their uh, mandate or in their business model. So it um, feels great to help somebody succeed uh, and also, uh, make uh, a good impact um, uh, on the ground in emerging markets. And, uh, we work across industries. You learn something new on each project. Uh, it's, it's both challenging and exciting. It's never dull. Although we're a rather small company, our client base is very diverse. So it's, it's like you're working with a new team each, each time you take on a new project. So it doesn't, doesn't get boring. So <laughs> these are some of the things that excite me. That's right. Yeah, and it seems that there's a lot of commonality in terms of, uh, you know, the sense of always kind of being on your toes and learning as you move in your career and also the sense of, of purpose too. And, and again, uh, and that's often something I tell my students in classes that I teach that, you know, having that curiosity about the world, you know, how different systems work and what distinguishes a country from another and really wanting to get to know the people in business. Um, I mean, that's definitely something that think is a real possibility to to fulfill in an international business career for sure. So great. So now to one of the questions that my students pinpointed. So in business classes, we work a lot um, you know, with different international business framework and theories. And I'm sure that's true in other fields too. I know that you come from a variety of different fields. But they are honestly wondering, like, how useful are these theoretical frameworks and, uh, you know, the theories that they have to study and implement work on, you know, cases with 
how important are they, are they actually in the real world? Do you use them in your daily work? So again, um, they're kind of curious about that aspect. And if you can speak to that and also maybe think about possibly the transferable skills that also tend to be developed as you work with theories and frameworks and, and things like that. So anybody can pick up and we can have a conversation around this. I'd love for you to kind of share and pick up on each other's ideas. Any volunteer for getting us kicked off here? And I could kick it off. I mean, I think that, you know, as somebody who didn't major in international business, and I can tell you there are a lot of case studies that I studied in the School of Political Management, a lot of different frameworks that, that we used. And for me, those are all about muscle memory. When you're when you're confronted with a problem, as all of the women here said that they are on every, you know on a daily basis, it's about having the tools to be able to dissect the problem and think and think about it in a certain way. I wouldn't say that you know on for any particular theory or framework that I learned in school that I go, oh, this is where I'm going to apply this. Um, nor do I even see my friends in some of the um, you know more. Uh, specialized skill sets like the legal um, field or the accounting field or some of those other draw from their specific frameworks or their specific casework. But what they do do is say, you know, oh, I've seen this before. This is how I would approach this problem. This is how I would think about this. And oftentimes in companies, particularly global ones, you're building that actually fit that company and then learning how to scale them and apply them so that you know, similar to what Allison said, you're building things out of the global center that can then be um, personalized for particular markets or regions. That's right. So a lot of the transferable skills and recognition of certain situations and problems. I think that's right, Stacy. I think that it's about um, using the, you know, I always think about it like interrogating the the brief or the question. So it's about having different mechanisms that you can go to to think about the problem that's being asked of you. I mean, oftentimes you're asked to put together a POV or a point of view on something. No one's going to specify what framework from school to use, but you might use one of them, whether or not the recipient of that document or that POV is even aware that you've used it. It's just a way to frame up your thoughts. Um, and I have definitely found um, frameworks to come in handy in that way. Um, but yes, yeah, so I think it's it's a, a, a lot about um, um, you know, ways to think about problems and to look at different avenues in which to solve them. And I would just add as well, just some of the basic things that you learn in school or skills. Um, you know, when I think back to, I also didn't uh, go to business school or uh, go to the undergraduate business school at GW. So um, one of the things when I started working for a large international company, especially one that's publicly traded, um, there are things like, you know, being able to read a balance sheet, follow quarterly earnings, like just very tangible things that you're learning right now that seem like, oh, I got to do this in my course, in my class, my homework, but they actually come in really big handy and things that I wished I had had in my uh, training in undergrad uh, would have served me well. Um, and just the multidisciplinary uh, nature of degrees at GW, I think, is really great for an international business career because we're all, you know, operating across disciplines, departments, working with legal, working with marketing, working with sustainability, working with engineering and, and you know, topics outside of our comfort zone. And I think being able to have a multidisciplinary degree or field or crossover with different schools within GW is, is a great asset of the university. Yeah, and, and I would add to, I would also like to highlight the importance of the inter interdisciplinary approach to problems. Our field is a little bit, more, my field is a little bit more specialized. I mean, to, to succeed in, I mean, you need to understand finance, right? You need to understand accounting. You need to understand basic financial structures, project finance versus corporate finance, you know, equity versus debt. So this is that this is the baseline, right? Like without it, you, you cannot possibly, uh, succeed or, or progress but uh, what, I mean but this is like at the analyst level once you progress further up you need to be able to think strategically you need to be able to pull uh, skills from from different disciplines you need to understand legal aspects of the transaction documentation you need to understand how to uh, you know negotiate 
uh, negotiate certain terms and move transaction forward. So it requires a whole different set of skills and a whole different set of frameworks that you pull from. Uh, but I think that uh, it's, a, it's important to learn uh, what you are being taught in school for sure. But it's also just important to always know that in real life, you will have to adjust a lot, especially, you know, based on the markets you're going to be working with. I mean, emerging markets operate quite differently. So you need to always keep an open mind, uh, pull from the uh, frameworks that you've learned, but always know that, that real life will, will make an adjustment to that. So um, being able to be flexible and pull from different disciplines is very important. Okay, great. So these are some some wonderful insights, and and again, um, you know, being able to be uh, flexible, being able to again think critically, work across disciplines. All these seem to be very important aspects, even though maybe you know you won't literally, <laughs> so to speak, uh, utilize every specific framework that you studied in school. But uh, hopefully, the way we we teach them in terms of case studies, simulations, and things like that, it will still be very helpful to the students. So. Okay, excellent. So now I want to get to our next question, and this has to do with you identifying a mistake that you made relating to international business. So it could be something maybe uh, in the market entry, maybe in a global rollout of a policy or something along those lines where it was really a, you know international business mistake that was made either by you personally or by your uh, organization. And then, of course, we want to know what did you learn from that? What did you take away from that mistake? Who has, has a mistake ready for us? It's always hard to pinpoint those, right? But they can be very helpful. I, I can start. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> uh, I can start by saying that I've made tons of mistakes in my in, in my in my role as I sort of progressed from from an analyst to to a director, uh, and I learn from from all of them. And I think without making mistakes, you can, it, it's, it's really, really hard to learn. So I would encourage you to, um, always, well, to try to take initiative and, uh, be bold and not be too afraid of making mistakes because ultimately, um, that's how we learn now for, for a specific, for a specific example, I guess for something that we learned, um, as an organization, um, is that no, uh, everything takes longer than you. I mean, this is like a basic, I guess a basic uh, 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 thing we learn, right? Everything in emerging markets takes longer. So you need to budget your uh, time accordingly and make promises to your clients with some cushion. Um, we always uh, are on the side of uh, sort of like under promise over deliver. So that's that's sort of our motto, uh, but then it's always important to um, to have a timeline, even if you are for a process, right? If you're trying to achieve a goal, even if you're not going to meet uh, different points in the timeline, just establishing it is important. And we see a difference on on projects where we just we don't have that, and the projects we when we do, you know. So uh, if, even if there are some delays, etc., it's it's always. Uh, leads to a more successful outcome. Um, and of, another one I would add, I guess, working across cultures um, and geographies, uh, never under, underestimate the difference in perception uh, and the way you have to adjust your communication based on who you're speaking with. Um, so, so it's very important to be as clear as possible um and not make it, you know not make assumptions that somebody just like understood you because you you know the, you know there was an implication in your statement that's commonly accepted say in the us so clear communication is very very important um and preferably um uh, following up in writing so that everybody's on the same page <laughs> so that's right I can piggyback on that. I think, you know, for me, there's a lot of different, I guess, more corporate case studies I, I could give you, but I think 
One of the most important just general lessons is to just be really culturally aware about the way in which you interact with your colleagues. And I can give you a personal example. Um, I moved from Chicago in a very boisterous office um, that was a, a public affairs consultancy, a small boutique public affairs consultancy that was made up of people like myself who were former press secretaries, um, really kind of a rough and tumble political group. Um, and our culture in our office in Chicago was, you know, you needed a colleague, you opened your office and you screamed down the hallway. Um, there were, you know, it was the type of, you know, balls were thrown across the room and um, it was a very, um, I would say really um, outgoing and kind of stereotypically masculine culture. Um, and I moved to Singapore and was put in charge of a team of 12 people at um, Ogilvy Public Relations. And my team included um, about a quarter of them were expats like myself from all over the world, not just the, not just the US. Um, and then um, also um, probably two thirds were Singaporean, but from all different cultures. Singapore itself is very much a mixing pot. Um, and I was told I was offending the group and I was carrying through the same sort of really boisterous communications that I had kind of grown up with as a leader and what I had learned from around me and modeled after for so many years of my career. And then suddenly found myself in a workplace where not only was that offensive, but it wasn't effective. Most importantly, not effective. And I needed to completely relearn the way that I engage with and manage my team. Everything from how do you get somebody's attention when you want to talk to them to, you know, how do you engage in a one on one conversation? It was not acceptable within the environment to walk up to somebody's cube and have a one on one conversation with them, even about something that was positive. It was felt to be too kind of barren out in the open and you needed to walk up to someone and say, hey, can I speak with you? Let's go find a huddle room. And slowing down and taking the time to just observe a totally different way of working and to learn was so crucial. And now I find, particularly in a global role that I am operating from this little TV room in my house, <laughs> it's very important to literally pause every time I get on the phone with somebody and think, who is this person I'm talking to? Where are they from? What is their culture? How do I need to interact with them? And then taking those learnings and, and thinking about what is the pace in the way I talk? How do I ask questions? How do I listen? How do I learn from every person that I'm speaking with? And not assume that the same behavioral traits are going to be effective as a leader in communicating to this particular person. That's great advice. I um I can't think of I mean off the top of my head just uh it, when you say a mistake I of course go to like a colossal failure, but I think it's more about um you know maybe the small mistakes that you make almost every day and um you know it could be anything from just forgetting to CC an executive on something or maybe you actually actually intentionally didn't CC them but it was the wrong call. I think it's about owning it. Um, and, you know, apologizing or taking ownership of the mistake right away and then course correcting um, quickly. That, that would be my, mm -hmm. uh, my advice yeah. on, on that topic. Thank you. And it can also just be something as simple as um, I, when I 1st started working for an international global company, it was um, challenging for me to figure out how to address people and emails with so much uh, going back and forth over emails um, and, you know, either the salutation or maybe the gender of that person. So something that has been and I stepped in it, I'm sure several times over <laughs> the course of my time, um, but something that has been really helpful has been um, putting pronouns in our signatures, which was something we did more from an inclusion perspective in the US, but it's been super helpful in a global company because, you know, the, everybody's name is slightly different. It might be something that I'm I've I've been misnamed in emails and and misgendered and you know so it it goes um, between from multiple cultures and different countries. So um, that's something that was 
super helpful and it's something that I try to also really keep in mind, similar to getting on the phone when I go to send an email. Um, I think of, you know, who am I addressing? Who am I, what's their, you know, level in the organization and how can I be most culturally aware? Okay, thank you so much. A uh, lot, uh, lots of good things to to think about. And again, I think this idea also of like um, uh, Allison was saying about course correcting and owning the mistakes and learning from them. That's you know what international business is all about, or any any career in, in essence, right? But especially important in international business because there are so many possibilities to make mistakes just because of all the cultural differences. So. Now, the next question has to do with the pandemic. So, of course, especially for international business professional, the workplace has really changed during the pandemic. So I just wanted to know about some specific challenge and we can kind of exclude the things that were challenges for everybody, like these eternal Zoom calls and, uh, you know, the virtual work, but really think about something that was specifically international business oriented. That was a challenge and also try to think about what is some good best practices that actually evolved over the pandemic that you think you'll be using or companies will be using uh, in this new world that we were hoping to get into post pandemic at some point, right? So let's just do kind of a quick round of, of uh, some reflections on the issues in the pandemic. Who's ready to I delve can, in? I, I... Go ahead, Tatiana. Thanks. Uh, so, yeah, I can, I can start. Um, so for emerging markets, right? It's a whole, um, uh, it's, it's a very specific case for, for us. Uh, certain projects we worked on just had to be suspended. Essentially certain industries are the, the, their future. Is so unclear that investors and lenders have had to reevaluate essentially their involvement, like the hotel, uh, hotel industry or, or, you know, um, um, or sort of tangential to services industries, right? So it's unclear what the future holds for those. Um, now, another very tangible aspect is that people could not travel and an important part of, uh, of due diligence uh, on, on the part of the lender or investor is actually going to the project and to meet with the team and, and everything on the ground. So that was not possible. And that meant that, um, the approval process for certain projects had to be, you know, pushed down the road. But then, for we actually did manage to close several, uh, a couple of transactions uh, with the virtual due diligence process, which is which has never been, I've never been a part of that before. So, like our Zoom calls with Africa are a lot less fun than actually going and meeting the team, but a lot cheaper. So maybe if this is, uh, if this is a practice that you know, lenders and investors figure out how to be comfortable with that. This can actually save a lot of money and time and people can join from various parts of the company that, you know, even from different locations, et cetera. So that, that, that could be great if, if, um, this is something that will continue. Um, and also just on a day to day, obviously we, we talk to our clients a lot, but we only see them when, well, before COVID, right. But we'd only see them when we go visit them. Now, video calls is such a big part of our lives that we, you know, I, we know our clients much, <laughs> much closer uh, than before. So I guess this is, this is a positive side. And, and also, I think people figured out how to work efficiently from home. And I think for us, uh, for our company, who has always been, you know, sort of uh, a little bit more conservative in that regard, everybody had to be in the office at a certain time. And there was a lot of emphasis on that. Now we're very, very dispersed, but we are still efficient and um, have a lot more freedom to, you know, over over our life and our schedule. So I think that's definitely positive. Great. I think Lauren, you made a, maybe had a comment as well. Oh, I echo Tatiana and that um, I, I think one of the positives of the pandemic is I feel closer to my international colleagues because similarly we use a lot more video calls. Um, you know, I, I work from a very small, almost satellite office within TE. So 
Um, I had a few members of my direct team there, but the rest of the team was international. So it was nice to get to connect with them on a more personal level because you inevitably get interrupted by pets or family or whatever might be happening that day. So uh, that's been fun. And, you know, I think on the, the challenge side, um, there's been just an unevenness of recovery and working for a global company, it can be hard to you know, keep track of and 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 continue programs like a employee engagement program when things are changing by the day, depending on the country and you might get something going and then you can just feel like if there's a surge or a lockdown that there's that loss of engagement or, you know, you can feel a fatigue coming from that. Um, so I think that's been a challenge running employee engagement programs during this time. Yeah, that might be a good place for me to begin. I mean, I think um, we all know, you know, in the United States, we faced a lot of issues with vaccine hesitancy and many businesses, including ours, have had their CEOs really chime in on the importance of getting vaccines even before the Biden administration created the OSHA guidelines that they created last week for large employers to mandate va vaccines for employees in the United States. But employment law is different all over the world. Um, and managing that aspect of it, along with our belief that we have to get as many people vaccinated as possible and the need to activate the executive voices around that to rally people really kind of strikes at the heart of the incongruencies between having a primarily um, US-based global management team and employees that are 50% outside of the US. And so we are constantly struggling with how do you use the bully pulpit of the channels that we have for, um, for our executives to weigh in on things like go get a vaccine when at the same time, some of the hardest hit nations do not have vaccine access. And so you're sort of go battling back and forth on that. When do we weigh in? How do we weigh in? Which I guess brings me to also, you know, the growth opportunity and the things that I think and hope will continue. Um, you know, we are really looking at how have our use of different ways of reaching employees, not just not just Zoom or in our case, Microsoft Teams and WebEx. Um, how do how do we um, also engage um, on all different kinds of channels to be able to level the playing fields so that everyone has access to content and engagement with executives and continue that in a really great way. And so we're learning upon the metrics that we've built during this time. And I can offer up, um, you know, historically our CEO has done, you know, quarterly all hands. Most, um, you know, most, CEO, most CEOs do do that. And typically when we would have an in-person all hands meeting that we would then broadcast out, it really was primarily for the people in the room and the attendance ratings really showed that. So we might have a couple hundred people in the room and then maybe four or 5,000 people would download it. We just recently did our first live global town hall where we had live Q and A from all over the world, and we had well over half the company dial in live, and that was just record breaking for us in every way. And so we're really trying to learn from that and go, okay, when we are back in the office, how do we build upon these successes rather than move backward? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. Allison, you get the last word on this one. Sure, um, we've had to pivot in lots of different ways, everything from the way that we are selling products in our retail stores and in our channel stores throughout the world. Um, I mean, the, the sheer volume of wayfinding signage and COVID protocol signage and the constant changing of it based on the constant ever changing nature of the guidelines from all of the governments worldwide has been I mean, just a phenomenal amount of work. And then just in, if you think about the Apple keynotes and the way that that has changed, they used to be live shows that were filmed and now they're basically uh, feature films, which we had to figure out how to do all, you know, I, I always say it's the metaphor is we're um, fixing the plane while flying it. So I think the, the general takeaway is, you know, being flexible and fluid is, is the best advice I can possibly give. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. So we have now reached uh, 550 almost, and uh, we really want to bring in the voices of the students who are in the audience. I had a last question for you, which is really mostly about advice to students, what they can do now to start building a career in international business. 
but maybe you can keep that question in mind and possibly incorporate it, or we can go to quick round of advice at the very end. But I definitely want to bring in the students now for some questions. And I know Emily has been keeping track of those, so I'll uh, hand it over to her to, to ask some of those questions. Sure, thanks, Dr. Helms. There are two questions in the Q&A and they're kind of similar. So um, I will just kind of let us kind of uh, get to both of those at once. It's really, how did each of you know that this is the career path that you wanted to pursue? And what skills did you have going into your respective roles that are, you are still using today? I can start with that one. I would say I did not know that this is the career path I was going to take. Um, I, as I mentioned, I majored in international affairs, thought I was going to go work for the State Department or, you know, Peace Corps or something like that. Um, all admirable career paths, of course, but I took an internship um, in my senior year at GW at the Department of Commerce and really saw the ability for corporations and economic development to be another avenue towards international development. So that kind of set me on that path. So I think my advice to the students would be don't um, assume you know what you want to do or that there's a clear career path because I think a lot of our role and I've you know opened this up to the rest of the panelists of course, but I think you kind of meander and find your way to the role and you get a new opportunity and you just take it. So that that flexibility and and uh, being versatile and also just being you know, a good team player and someone that um, is fun to work with, I think is is a huge uh, benefit to bring into and a skill that I use to answer the second question there. It's definitely a journey, as Lauren said, you know, I think there it's about experiencing as many things as possible. And it's as important to understand the things that you don't enjoy as it is to understand the things that you do. And it's as important to understand the things that you don't, you're not good at as it is understanding the things that you are. Um, I think that certainly helps you sort of figure out, you know, your North Star. I think for, um, so for, for me, I started out my career as a journalist and I was very clear that that's what I wanted to do. And then a few years in, I was very clear that I wasn't quite wanting to do that for the rest of my life. And I think that taught me a very early lesson that you know, it's not about having the goal of where you want to be in 20 years, but having the goal of where you want to be in two years and where you want to be in five years and always marching towards something. And so I always approach um, every job as what am I here to contribute and what am I here to learn? And I still approach things like that, even, you know, 20 plus years into my career. So, um, and that's really um, grounding for me on the really challenging days when I'm like, this is, I'm doing something really dumb today, or this is really challenging today and I don't like it. I just say like, what am I learning? And if I can check the box that I'm learning the thing I came here there to learn, then that's helpful. And then building on those transferable skills for wherever I decide to go next. And I think, you know, more often than not today, people have what they call jungle gym careers where, you know, they're different building blocks and it's really more um, of, a, of a staircase diagonal role where you're building on things and building on things than a straight up and down ladder. Yeah, absolutely. I have, all of these are great, you know, great points and I uh, concur with, with, with all of them. I also, I did not know what I wanted to do necessarily. My undergraduate degree is in interpreting and translation linguistics. So very far removed from finance. Uh, but, you know, the international aspect was there. So I, I did some work as an interpreter, which I enjoyed a lot. Um, my degree at GW was international affairs with econ concentration. Um, I tried out a bunch of internships when I was at GW, which is my advice to you. Try out, try things out and you will see what you like. You will see what you're good at and you'll see what you don't like. And then you can sort of correct your course as you learn, you know, new information, but Make sure at in each position, you know, give your best, be a team player, be hardworking and curious, um, learn as much as you can, and eventually you'll, you'll, you know, you'll figure out what the next step is. Um, yeah. Thank you all so much. And I think this segues really well into two of the other questions. Um, and they've kind of been touched on a little bit already, which was really how do we enter this industry after graduation, which we talked about internships, but then also can you share your first post grad jobs 
all of you are extremely accomplished and successful today, but would love to know more about where you started. So Stacy mentioned she was in journalism. If you don't mind sharing like specifically where you started and um, that's a lot of, you know, where students will start to look themselves. Yeah, and I think there's a great learning there too. So when I, um, you know, similar to Tatiana's um, great advice, I had done a lot of different internships in college and I'd originally thought I wanted to go into fashion journalism. And um, I did, in, in, in on, a, on a whim, my uh, junior year, I did a White House internship that was not in journalism and I loved it. And my senior year made a very sudden switch to, um, to hard news, but I wanted to be really sure. So the summer before my senior year of college, I did an internship at W Magazine in the features and fashion department. And I was such a fish out of water. It didn't matter that I liked design or fashion. It was just not my culture. Um, and so it helped me to really know where I was going. So my first job out of, um, out of undergrad was at the New Republic as a reporter researcher. And I very quickly learned um, that magazine was too slow of an environment for me. I needed like a really um, upbeat daily newsroom. I also, I had chosen between that role and um, a wire service role that paid triple the amount and was really um, encouraged by my family to take the job that was the passion point. And that was um, really important learning because the connections that I made there at the New Republic, which is a magazine I'd always, always loved and somewhere I'd always kind of aspired to be really were the building blocks for um, the next, you know, five to 10 years of my career. My first. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Lauren. Oh, okay. My first roll out of college was being an executive assistant, which I. Didn't I'm not particularly good at administrative tasks. I, I've made it work. I'm organized, but you know, I thought I would be like an analyst or an entry level associate or something like that. But it ended up being a really great role and got me the job I have now because I was working directly for the CEO of a trade association that still exists and represents um, international companies who invest in the United States, um, of which TE was one of them. Um, so I was able to make a lot of connections with government affairs and tax leads from all of the different uh, organizations that were members, huge corporations, and was able to maneuver into a, a corporate role. So it ended up being great. I worked in a corporate special events um, agency and also as an internship. Um, and um, I, I leveraged that job. Somebody I worked with there had moved to a different company. And so what I want to, and then I started working in agencies, marketing and advertising agencies and branding agencies. But what I want to say is it's about, you know, maintaining your network and continuing to, um, you know, reach out to people that, you know, through LinkedIn or whatever mechanism it is. And um, don't be afraid to, you know, say hello, introduce yourself. Um, you know, thank, send thank you emails. I think you can never uh, uh, underestimate the value of a thank you email. I had somebody I work with, a brand director recently tell me that she specifically doesn't hire people that don't send thank you emails. So um, while I don't necessarily do that, I feel like there's just some, you know, there's some uh, small learnings there, but it's about, you know, just fostering your, your network. Yeah, so as, as I said, I started um, uh, as um, I started working for an NGO uh, after my undergraduate degree as an interpreter. So then sort of pivoted my um, career to international business slash finance. Um, at GW, I turned at uh, OPIC, uh, which is now DFC, U.S. Development Finance Corporation, which is a federal um, bilateral development bank. I interned with the political insurance department, which I I I, I enjoyed it. Uh, I joined the international aspect of it, the international transaction aspect of it, not so much the insurance part of it. <laughs> so I, I I I knew I wanted to do something like that, but not having to deal with insurance contracts. So my <laughs> my job was exactly that, but minus minus insurance. Although we did have to we do have to deal with that once in a while, but that's not our core. Uh, expertise, 
but for, for me what what I really liked uh, about my job when I started and I still do is that it deals with concrete projects and um, it's just it's satisfying to know that you're contributing to a thing that you can see and touch um, and that's ultimately helpful but my I just wanted to add my internship at DFC was very very helpful and helped me to to get the job so make sure you you take you take these opportunities while you're still at school. Thank you all so much. I know we're um, like out of time, but if you don't mind staying on, we have a couple more great questions. If you cannot, it's we completely understand and students as well. If you want to stay on and listen to a couple more answers, um, there's just a, a few more questions and they are really strong questions. So this one is for Lauren and Stacy in particular. Um, Chow would love to know. How challenging it was to land a role that focused on corporate social responsibility and diversity, equity, and inclusion within your respective companies. And what advice would you have for a first year MBA student looking to pivot into that type of role or consulting in that type of role? Um, I'm happy to I'm happy to take it. Um, first of all, let me just say there's really fewer there are really few fewer more exciting places to be working in right now and for me it is technically a smidgen of my responsibility but it's my passion point and so i lean in and really own this piece of my portfolio because it's a place where i really feel like i can leave lasting change behind in my role and that's you know really really important to me um you know, I think for um, someone who's interested in, in this type of role is to just um, find the opportunities, even if they're perhaps more junior than you would be um, wanting to just get your foot in the door. The competition is really fierce, and I do think it's one of those things where, um, you know, particularly what we see at Visa is every time we open up a role that is purpose oriented, we get a ton of internal applications. Um, a lot of people are, are interested in going from more traditional parts of the business into our social impact space or into anything that is social impact related. Um, but it is an area of expertise. Um, so getting some, some specialized classes under your belt, some internships under your belt so that you can beat those candidates out is really very important to be looked at as an external candidate in that space. Um, because a lot of times companies are going for the people who understand the company rather than understanding this area. And it, it really is in some ways doing the craft a disservice because it is a specialty just like everything else. And there are, um, is a lot of expertise around getting companies to do the right thing in this space and meet the new rising societal expectations. You're so right, Stacey. I think it, I think another challenge is our teams are usually very small, but this could be a good entry point because I rely on so much um, personal volunteering around the company. I have subject matter experts that I pull into my orbit of CSR. I have um, people that volunteer for me and represent our communities at our local markets. So I would also say to, um, you know, in addition to gaining some of those specialized skills through your MBA, which I know a lot of MBA programs have a sustainability minor or focus area that's that's available to you now, which will be really great. Um, you know, even getting into a company where you admire their CSR efforts um, and, you know, finding a way to volunteer or enter an employee resource group or affinity group or, you know, be a part of their community engagement activities, you'd be surprised how many people have been turned that into a real a real job, a full-time job um, in more of that purpose space. So, um, and I always also give the tip that um, CSR jobs sneakily hide out under various names. So things like purpose, social impact, sustainability, environmental, um, uh, there's the list goes on, um, citizenship. Um, so definitely when you're looking at roles, um, there's a bunch of, uh, different roles within the company that might have pieces of CSR, so that could at least be um, a portion of your job. Thank you both so much. Um, this is combining about two of our questions as well, and it's really focused on international students. 
So, uh, what advice do you have for international students who are looking for sponsorship or H 1B visas in order to um, be able to work in the country? And specifically, this 1 came through um, from somebody who's been living in the USA for 3 years and has a strong accent and works in customer service. So, do you have advice as sometimes it takes. Her team, uh, sorry, it's hard to understand and they have a problem understanding some words. Is that going to be a problem for her in the future with her accent to join a big company? So any advice for international students looking for sponsorship or working with others in di this different cultural context? Well, I, 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 can, I can start as an as an international student myself, former international student, I guess. Well, I mean, I hate to say it, unless you take on like a technical job where, where you don't have to talk to people, this is, you, you're gonna have to, you're gonna have to learn how to speak at least as, you know, at least uh, under, so that people can understand you and can understand others. I mean, it's fine to have an accent, but um, this is something you will necessarily need to work on, right? I mean, there's no way around it. So this could be this could be a goal <laughs> to to work on, and it's quite it's quite achievable, right? We hire international students all the time, and a lot of our interns are international. International students bring uh, some of the mind like the mindset that we need uh, in terms of that they they have experience living abroad. They they've experienced what it's uh, like to be in an environment quite different from uh, a developed economy like the U.S. They're usually uh, not all the time, but oftentimes are very hardworking. Sometimes more hardworking because they really uh, want to prove themselves and sort of go an extra mile, etc. So we appreciate all of these qualities, uh, but we do require, you know, fluency in English because uh, you know they need to be able to communicate clearly, put together materials in English, uh, and eventually if they were to progress to say a full time position communicate to our clients um, uh, and it's, it's it's really important that we can trust them as representatives of our company thank you so much tatiana that's so true um, we're getting really great questions but i i don't want to keep you all for too long dr helm do you think it would be because i know some it's the middle of the day for some of you all. Um, maybe we can have one last question and then I can gather the questions and send them to the panelists afterwards to make sure students questions get answered. Do you think that sounds okay? Yeah, I think that's a great solution. I, I did okay. see there was a lang language question too. That is definitely something that I think would be interesting for students to know about uh, working internationally. Obviously, it's very helpful uh, to know a, a foreign language. But I don't know if you want to share if you do know a foreign language or not. Tatiana obviously is, is probably bilingual uh, more so than anything, but. I do not I know a foreign language. <laughs> I can say that for us, we work, uh, although we work in emerging markets, some languages are more helpful than others. I should say that all business, most, most of all, of our, I, would, I would say 90% of our transactions are conducted in English. Uh, a foreign language is helpful if it's for us, if it's like Spanish or, or French, Spanish is more helpful because we are, we work more, you know, with projects in Latin America, but it needs to be at a degree where like you can have a meeting in that language. Otherwise it's not particularly helpful. So mm. if you can order a meal at a restaurant, I mean, it's cute, but it's not going to be particularly helpful in a, in a business environment. That's right. Honest opinion. <laughs> yep. Yeah, so I think we can, like I said, I'll gather the questions from the chat box and send it to the panelists later and be sure to, to get these students um, some answers because they are really strong questions. But again, I don't want to keep you all past your time. So um, I'll just quickly say thank you so much to all the students and to the panelists and Dr. Helm, I'll let you take us out from here. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm not going to expand the time further, but thank you so much. It was delightful to have this conversation. So much terrific advice for the students, lots of things to think about. And also love the idea that you have been able to really forge careers out of very different places and getting to this impressive level. So 
show some students with your role models, you know, in mind that they can do maybe something similar and forge their own way in international business. So again, thank you so much for your time. Thank you to all the students who were here as well and for your great questions. So, and have a good night. Thank you all. Have a great evening. Thank you. Thank, thank, thank you. you. Best of luck. Thanks everyone. Bye. Bye.